I thought that for this series I would do uh, a few videos on the book of Ephesians, which is one of my favorite epistles. It's the only epistle that Paul wrote where he never criticized the people he was talking to at all. In all the other ones, he corrected them on some things. He never corrected the Ephesians. Uh, later on in Revelation, they were uh, the ones who left their first love. But this epistle seems to be during the time when they had not yet left their first love. So it's a very important epistle that way. And it talks about Christian maturity. There was a, a teacher named uh, Chairman Nee. He was a, an Asian Christian teacher. He wrote a book called Sit, Walk, Stand. It's all about the, the book of Eph the letter of the uh, Ephesians. Uh, where, and it's absolutely right that uh, I haven't read his book. So I don't know about what all the details are in his book, but it's absolutely true that there's six chapters in the epistle of the Ephesians. And the first two are about sitting in Christ, learning who Christ is. The second two chapters are about walking in Christ, walking in the Christian ways. And the last two chapters are about standing in Christ. And that's uh, like a Christian warrior. The armor of God, uh, as most people know from Ephesians. So I thought it would be a great epistle to study just the whole epistle. I find that if you're having trouble with, with your Christianity and, and getting a... a a handle on the foundation of your faith. There's three epistles that are, to, to me, are the, the, the hit it out of the park for getting you uh, in the roots of your Christianity. Galatians, Ro Romans, and Ephesians. Those three are uh, so, uh, so great on um, establishing you in the faith. So, um, it's one of those three video, one of those three uh, epistles. So I really uh, appreciate that. I haven't read those three epistles in their entirety for quite a while now. I've read them several times, but not for uh, probably a decade now. I haven't read them completely. Um, so it'd be nice to get back to that and, and revisit that. And uh, so I welcome you to listen along and, and we'll talk about each thing, each topic that comes up. I, I have no idea what I'm going to run into exactly. Uh, of course, I've referred to the Epistle of Ephesians many times uh, on different topics. But sit, reading it from front to back, I haven't done that in a long time. So it should be uh, good for me, I know, and hopefully good for the uh, viewers. Okay, so what else was I going to say? Nothing. So let's get started. Start in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So this is to the peop the saints at the Christian saints at Ephesus, and to all the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who this is to. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly, in heavenly places in Christ. So you can see where he's talking about um, God the Father and Jesus Christ separately. Um, they are both part of the Godhead, 
uh, that is uh, sitting on the throne of God. But we're learning more about God, the God the Father, through Jesus Christ. So this is, Jesus is so close to God and so much a part of God. He's the Son, right? So you could say the Trinity, he is the Father and the Son, is God. Uh, because they are so much alike um, that it's hard to tell them apart. Okay? Sort of think of it that way. And he blesses us in Christ. He, Christ is a man. Don't forget, he went to heaven in the flesh. His body was brought, ascended up to heaven. And he said, I will return. And that will be the second coming. So, he's the, he is God in the flesh. This is what they mean when they say God in the flesh. He is the man. He's the man and he's God. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That is, that's before the world was created. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So that's like the Father predestined us to, to be adopted to him as sons of God through Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he has made us accepted in the Beloved. So he has made us his Beloved, a part of his Beloved, right? Now there's, um, during, uh, say about the 16th, 17th century, uh, during the Reformation time in Europe, there was uh, one of the uh, prominent reformers named John Calvin. Uh, you might have heard of Calvinism. And it's brought a lot of um, maybe bad, bad things upon Christianity and a lot of good things for other reasons. But there's uh, this uh, teaching called predestination where we see this is one of the verses here, right? He chose us before the foundation of the world, and he predestined us to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ. Okay, so predestination, according to Calvin, predestined would be like each person from before the world was even created was already predestined to either be be saved or be evil so there it's like there's nothing you can do about it you know it's already been determined before you were even born before the foundation of the world it was determined that you would be saved or determined that you would be evil well that's that's what the doctrine, doctrine of predestination basically sits upon. And that is um, flawed, in my opinion. Because there's a lot of other reasons. First of all, why would God say repent? Or why would God say, uh, I, I put before you good and evil, therefore choose good and reject evil. Um, and there's always, in the entire Bible, there's this, always this, if you do this, it will go that way. And if you do that, it will go this way. It's your choice. So that kind of flies in the face of predestination. Uh, if you're predestined and everything's predestined, then why bother? Why even try? You know? So 
Um, I, I studied this predestination in the scriptures um, years ago, and I think what I determined from all of my studies was that it's not the person who is predestined, it's the path. It's like that road is predestined. Say you have a fork in the road, and if you go that way, the road is going to Chicago, and if you go that way, the road is going to New York. So those roads have a destination. So when you make a choice, that path that you choose has a destination. So that's the predestination. So when Paul, Paul here is saying, uh, what exactly are his words? He's saying, uh, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So predestined us. I think what he's saying is predestined Christians. He's saying that uh, Christianity was already thought of by God since the foundation of the world. So uh, you, you can find uh, mess Christian messianic prophecies even in the Garden of Eden in the Bible. So um, particularly the, uh, the uh, child of the woman shall crush the snake's head. The foot of the woman's child will crush the snake's head. That's talking about Jesus Christ. It's a child of the woman. The woman is humanity. Okay, every humanity is being born of a woman. Every child born out of a human woman is a part of humanity. So it's saying a, 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 a human born out of humanity will be born from a woman who will crush the serpent's head who will crush the works of the devil and crush the bringing in of death. And Jesus Christ is that child who was born, who did all of that. So that's the predestination, is, is Christians are predestined. So if you become a Christian, you put yourself on that path that has a destination. That's what predestination really means. But if you choose not to be a Christian, then you're on another path. Now, wherever that leads, it will lead that to many different paths. But, uh, and you can, you come to forks in the road, down the road more too. So you still have choices to make. But um, if you choose Christ and stick with Christ, and I'm talking about, by reading the Gospels and by reading the works of the Apostles, that Christ, then uh, that path will lead you to a good destination, guaranteed, if you stick with it. <clears throat> That's another contentious issue, whether you can leave it or not. I'd say you can, but stick with it and... Uh, you're predestined to go to a good place, okay? Your, your destination has already been made out. You don't have to wonder where you're going. You know where you're going. So anyway, so where were we? Um, to the praise and glory of His grace, God's grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the in the beloved so the beloved is a class of people the beloved of god and he made us jesus made us a part of the beloved okay verse 7 in whom we have redemption 
through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the richness of his grace. So in Jesus we have redemption, redeemed. That means uh, we were sold and into slavery and we are brought back. Okay? We're bought back, redeemed. Okay? By the forgiveness of sins. And the forgiveness of sins by the law. You see, the law of Moses is the law of God. And so, just like today, you see um, people on both sides. One side is the, is the prosecutor, the other side is the defendant. And they're both honoring the same law. But one is trying to convict the person under that law, and the defendant is trying to defend himself under the same law. Okay? So, the sins in the law are forgiven by the shedding of blood by a lamb in the Old Testament, right? Or a bull, or... But Jesus Christ... He brought that system to another level where he, um, he gave himself as an offering to God. His, he, he sacrificed himself. So Self-sacrifice is what it is. And he um, gave his own life to God and God said, okay, that's the, the new way of looking at the law, is that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. And it's the same law, but it kind of, uh, it's, like, it's like the defense came out with this great um, defense against the prosecutor and said, this is still under the law, but this is something we, have, we haven't, thought of before but if we follow the law this is the way it will work and so Jesus was the one who um, who came out with this great new defense under the law and he is the leader of it and it's like a, a class action suit so we are all in it in the class action and and God is the judge so you sort of think of it that way, right? Okay, and the devil, of course, is the accuser. So, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. So he made, he gave us all this wisdom about what God's plan was since the foundation of the world in the whole Hebrew Bible. God's plan has always been to um, culminate in this, this, uh, crucifixion of Christ and that this is sort of the the fulfilling of all that was hidden before which is now um, the wisdom of God being made known and he which he purposed in himself right his purpose in in himself God in the flesh right that was his purpose, was to make known to us the mystery of his will. Okay, <clears throat> verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, so that when the time becomes complete, he might gather together into one all things in Christ, both in heaven and on earth, even in him. 
so that all things are gathered together under this one principle of the law of Christ or the law the law which is the same as the law of Moses but it's the law according to the interpretation of Christ okay okay so even in him in whom so when you are a believer in Christ and a follower of Christ you are in Christ so in whom also we have obtained an inheritance so because we also become sons of God we also have an inheritance from our father being being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will so we are a part of that predestined path according to the purpose of God who makes all things work according to his purpose okay so if you get on this path this is what your your goal will your your great inheritance this is what is the reward at the end of this path okay you you're you we've already obtained an inheritance we already have it we just have to walk towards it okay that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ so he's talking about his own time now right we that the first churches we that they are the praise of his glory they we're reading it now you see and we're understanding it and we're joining also so uh, that's the praise of God's glory of those who first trusted in Christ in whom you Ephesians and us other Christians also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise so when you receive the Holy Spirit after being baptized then you are sealed it's like I explained before when a scroll is written if there's a seal placed upon it and that seal cannot be broken until it's delivered to the person who the letter is sent to and then when the letter arrives at the, the the person it's sent to then that person breaks the seal and reads the letter so you are sealed and sent to towards God with that seal and nobody can break that seal now verse 14 which is so all of this being sealed which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory so that's a, that's the seal okay we are we are sealed with the spirit of promise and that is the earnest that's a that's our great that's what drives us to our inheritance until we get to the destination that's what's driving us the spirit of promise right okay the promise of God we believe that his promise we believe he's promised to us and we are wa walking towards the destination to receive that promise and we absolutely believe that we will receive it so that drives us to go get it right okay and, and what is the promise? The redemption of the purchased possession. That God will open that seal. And God will accept that letter. Right? Until we, are, we will be redeem, completely redeemed. And that's the, the kingdom of God. Right? 
and the praise of his glory. That's when it all comes to an end, all, it all becomes fulfilled. We will be a part of that. Okay? So wherefore, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Okay, so that's uh, understanding the Bible. Okay, the spirit of wisdom and the revelation. Uh, understanding the knowledge of the Bible and having the, the, the knowledge of God revealed to you. The knowledge of him right the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling so that you may know what that destination is that you're going to and what your hope is okay you may know fully what that is and fully how you're going to get there Okay, but it takes time to learn this. So on your journey, you are learning all of this, right? And the, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Uh, what all are we going to receive when we get there? And, and, and along the way, by the way, and what, what all these riches... In the Bible, wisdom is often called riches of his wisdom. It's very, uh, it's like, um, it's sort of like money. Like, when you gain wisdom, it's, uh, you're, you're, you, it never, I can't say it never leaves you, because you can forget it too. Um, but when you gain wisdom, Knowledge is information. You, you read books, you learn things, you gain, you gain knowledge. But wisdom is knowing what to do with that knowledge. So it's like a next level after knowledge. So gaining wisdom is like money because it's a skill that you gain that will benefit you from now on. So that's what he's saying, is the riches of the wisdom. Okay? The spirit of wisdom. So that's God giving you wisdom. You don't have it, but he will give it to you. Okay? And, and being enlightened, he will, he will show you things. Okay? That you may know what is the hope of his calling that what what he's calling you for and what he's going to give to you when you get there okay okay and starting in verse 19 and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us so what the great things that he is able to do to help us even now, even on our way, right? So this is also wisdom, to know what God can do for you and what, how much power he has in your life, okay? To us word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. So if we believe in God and we learn of how much power he actually has, and we know that that power is being used to help us, then that is also great riches. Okay? Verse 20, <clears throat> which he wrought in Christ, which God did in Christ. God made Christ. Like when you're talking about the flesh, God in the flesh, that's Christ, right? So he is a man. Christ is a man, but he's also God. So God made that. He made Christ. And that's his beloved. 
That's his son. And he has the fullness of the Spirit of God within him. But he's also flesh. So that's Christ. So that's, um, when you think of the Trinity, that's, it's three ways of seeing God, right? There's God the Father, the, the, the ultimate powerful one who created everything. Christ is God in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit is God's love in all, that is in all of creation. So it's all God, but it's three ways of understanding God. And also, being the Christ is another existence of God. It's God in the flesh, so that you can talk to him, and you can shake his hand, you can hang out with him. Because he's a, he's a man just like we are. He's a human. But he's also God. So that's what Christ is. Right? Okay. And that we also are a part of that inheritance. We also are sons. But we don't have the full measure of God yet. But we have, everyone has a certain measure, a certain amount. And as you grow, you gain wisdom, you gain more connection, and, and more of that spirit, and more of that strength in knowing who you are, and where you're going, and what God can do for you. Okay? So... Jesus had all of that, 100%, because he was born that way. But he was born that way to lead us into an inheriting the same thing. But, we, but just as he died, we also must die once and then be resurrected. So that kind of separates this world from that world. Death is the separation. So Christians are not afraid of death because that's just us moving into the next world. But um, the death has to happen a certain way too. Or else, you know, you can't just kill yourself. It doesn't work that way. So, you know. <laughs> anyway, so that that's sort of, you know, getting to this... Um, understanding of Christ, of who Christ is, and what Christ is, okay? Okay, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand in the heavenly places? Okay, at his own right hand. So what is the right hand? What is the right and the left? Well, if you think of, um, you see, to us, um, we, in modern times, we all use north as the, 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 the default direction, okay? There's north, and then uh, south is behind you. Where am I? North. And west is to your left, east is to your right, okay? So that's basically because of the compass, the discovery of true magnetic north, uh, back in, say, the 17th century or so, that uh, ever since then, the whole world has sort of been aligned towards magnetic north. But, and if you see a map, any map you see, the top of the map is always north. But in ancient times, they didn't know anything about magnetic north. And so to the Hebrews, uh, west was ahead of you. The future's west, the unknown. So that was looking out over the Mediterranean Sea. So that to them was forward. And that's the unknown, the sea. 
What's under the sea? Where does the sea go? It's the unknown. Behind them was the east. So they would speak, the, the, the word for east is also the word for the past. So, and so then that would make Egypt to your left and Mesopotamia to your right or the north to your right. Okay, so the right arm is the arm of power, and the left is uh, more of the arm of protection. You would keep your, your woman on your left and fight with your right arm, right? So it's, it's the right arm of power, okay? So Jesus sits at the right hand of God. He's the power of God over the world. Um, between God and evil is Jesus. So that's the sword, the word of God. And his beloved are on this side, his, his church, his woman, right? Okay. So Christ is at the right hand of God in heavenly places. Far, verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in, the, in that which is to come. So God is above every power. So when you're talking about the courts and how things work under God and the justice of God and the law of God, the army of God, God Christ is in charge of all of that. Okay? And which is even more powerful than the powers of darkness. Because God says, I created light and I created darkness. I created good, I created evil. So evil and darkness are something that is there to check us, to, to push us to better ourselves, to push us to learn of God, and it's also failure. Right, it's it's uh, it's it's all those things that are causing you to exercise your wisdom, exercise uh, your faith, exercise all these godly things that God wants you to learn. So God also has all power over the evil. It's like the judge. The judge has the power over the prosecutor and over the defense. The judge is the one who's going to make the final decisions, right? So um, he has placed Christ above all those other powers, all of it. So this is uh, where we're getting the part of sitting. Where is Christ sitting, right? And how are... How are we connected to Christ? Okay, verse 22. And he has put all things under his feet. So God has put all things under the feet of Christ, meaning he has power over all of them. And he gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So... God has put all things under the feet of Jesus, and he gave Jesus to be the head over all things to the church. So all of the believers have a connection with Jesus, and he's the head of all things. It's like your body, right? You have your backbone and your spine and your nerves that go to every part of your body so that you feel every part of your body and you're, 
your mind is in control of every part of your body. Your mind can protect every part of your body. Your mind is, is the, 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 the seat of power over the entire body. So that's Christ and the church. So that every single cell in the body can send a message to the mind, and the mind can send a message to that cell. So um, that's Christ, his relationship to the church. Okay? Oh, he's, Jesus is the head of the church, and the church is his body. The fullness of him that fills all in all. So now he's it's it's talk even touching upon the Holy Spirit now. Is Jesus is the body and the fullness of him that fills everything in creation. Also Christ is the fullness in the church. Right? So in the people who have become sons of God, that's the church. And so Christ is the fullness of that. And his spirit is in all of that. Where God's spirit is in all of creation. You see? So it's a part of a part of God's creation, but not the complete thing. That Christ is the head of the church. Okay? So there's a division between what is holy and what is not holy. All right, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week in, uh, for Chapter 2. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to help out the channel. Thank you very much. Bye.